Coming up this week, Notebook LM gets a new video mode that could transform your presentations. Microsoft joins the AI browser wars. The latest Stack Overflow survey shows us what engineers really think about AI in the workplace with some surprising results. And Mark Zuckerberg says that you regret not wearing AI glasses. As always, if you enjoyed the briefing, hit the subscribe and the like button. So first up this week, Notebook LM is getting a UI refresh and a new videos overview mode. The UI refresh adds new iconography to differentiate between audio and other types of media. And the video overviews will transform source materials into video presentations. These presentations include both source materials and imagery created by generative AI. But is it any good? I put it to the test and here's an example of a video overview it created using a notebook on API strategy and negotiation. The cost of a single text isn't just one number. It's actually a stack of three completely separate layers of fees. So here are the three layers. First up, you've got your provider fee. Now, to be fair, describing these as videos may be a bit of a stretch since they're more akin to presentation slides, but still, they're a neat addition and could be a helpful way to create new presentations. And it's not just Notebook LM that's introduced these new AI video features. This week, Yelp is rolling out a new AI-powered feature that brings to life user reviews. This new feature stitches together video content posted by real reviewers, along with audio generated by Eleven Labs. Now, this is a pretty unique way to bring to life reviews, which tech companies could also lean on for reviews of their own products. And speaking of new voice features, Spotify's chief product officer has hinted at a new conversational interface for Spotify that could be coming soon. Speaking during the company's earnings call this week, Gustav Soderstrom explained that following the launch of voice features earlier in the quarter, which allow users to make voice requests to DJ, the company was now building up a unique data set, which he described as very, very valuable. As a result, we should expect the Spotify consumer experience to become much more interactive. You can already write to Spotify and talk to Spotify, and you're just going to see that expand, he said. So I'm looking forward to seeing what Spotify is cooking up here. And voice is certainly starting to gain traction as the preferred UI for many users. And in a recent DOP poll, almost 50% of respondents say that they now interact with software through voice. Just this month, Meta acquired a voice AI startup, and recent studies show that 55% of Gen Z is now using voice to control software. And if you're interested in learning more about how companies are using voice, then head over to Substack this week, where I take a look at over 25 plus different real world examples from companies like Shopify, Microsoft, Perplexity, and more, showing how voice is transforming everything from customer onboarding to coding workflows, along with some new tools that you can use to add voice capabilities to your own product. Elsewhere this week, Microsoft has joined the AI browser wars with an update to Edge. Copilot mode allows users to browse the web while being assisted by AI. Once enabled, Edge users can ask Copilot questions about open tabs and instruct it to perform actions on their behalf, either by typing or by using your voice. In other words, it works pretty much in the same way as Dia and Perplexity's comment. Satya Nadella says that this is just the first iteration and that there's more to come. But with incumbents like Microsoft now reaching feature parity so quickly, it'll certainly ramp up the pressure on Deer and Comet to figure out how to differentiate themselves. Chrome is said to be cooking up its own version of an AI browser, and this week, Google released a new way to group search results with something called WebGuide, which is different to its AI mode, and it works by grouping web links into groups or bundles based on the query that has been entered by a user. So for example, if you type in how to travel solo in Japan, it'll give you a curated results page, which is grouped into different categories like personal experiences from other travelers and restaurants you can try. Google also revealed a new vibe coding mini app called Opal, which is designed to take on the likes of Lovable and Cursor. And this type of vibe coding app may come in handy to people who actually work at Google, since one of its product leaders said on X this week that its teams were moving away from a writing-first culture to a building-first culture. Speaking on X, the product leader at Google said that writing used to be a proxy for clear thinking, optimized for scarce engineering resources and long development cycles. Now, when the time to vibe coding a prototype is roughly equivalent to the time to writing a PRD, PMs can show and not tell. Role profiles are blurring, creativity and building are happening in parallel. And I can understand the reasoning here, but there's definitely a risk that people jump straight into solutions before properly understanding what problems to be solved. What do you think? Is jumping straight to vibe-coded prototypes a good idea for product teams? Let me know in the comments below. Elsewhere this week, ChatGPT is getting a new study mode. It is designed for students, but could equally be useful for professionals who want to learn more about specific topics. So rather than offering up answers to questions immediately, Study mode breaks down topics into easily digestible chunks with interactive prompts and knowledge checks through quizzes. 
New data shows that ChatGPT is now ahead of Reddit on mobile users, with users using the app on an average of 13 days a month. And NVIDIA's CEO recently admitted that learning new concepts is one of his most common use cases for AI. With research suggesting that our brains are suffering as a result of over-reliance on AI, then this new feature is probably a good thing. Now let's take a look at some tools you can use, and we'll start with the new startup that has raised $10 million this week to develop its product further. And this is called Julius. It describes itself as the AI analyst that works for you. So you can connect your data, ask questions in plain English, and get insights in seconds. Reviewers from the likes of Fast Company said that it's remarkably versatile and can be used for virtually any type of business or scientific data. So if you're looking for a simple and clean way to analyze data, then Julius could be an interesting product to take a look at. The next is something called Bugbot, and this is developed by Cursor. And Bugbot reviews pull requests and identifies bugs and security issues before they get merged into your code base. Anyone who's built a Vibe coded app knows that the introduction of bugs and security risks is a real issue, and Cursor is hoping that with the launch of Bugbot, it can spot those issues further upstream. So far, engineering leaders at the likes of Discord, Rippling, and Sentry have all used it, with the CPO of Sentry saying that the hit rate from Bugbot is insane. Teams can customize how Bugbot does its reviews, and it automatically integrates with GitHub. So if you're looking for new ways to spot bugs, then Bugbot could be worth checking out. And the final product for this week is something called Frigade, and I hope I'm, spell I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, but essentially, Frigade is a new way to help your users navigate your SaaS product. And the way it works is that Frigade deploys intelligent agents that use your product as real users would. So once they're added to your product, these agents automatically navigate through your latest workflows, document the current user experience, and then ingest your existing knowledge base and training materials. This means that Frigade understands your product the same way as your users do by actually experiencing it. The result, they say, is more accurate contextual responses they reflect how your product actually works today. So if you're looking for new, smarter ways to onboard your users, then check out Frigade. Now let's take a look at some data and trends. And the major piece of research from this week is the latest Stack Overflow Developer Survey for 2025. Now this report contains all sorts of interesting nuggets. And here's some of the pieces that I found most interesting. So this survey shows that engineers like and trust AI less in 2025 than they did in 2024. So if you take a look at this graph, you'll see that only 33% of developers trust AI accuracy in 2025, down from 43% in 2024 and 42% in 2023. As well as this, AI favorability dropped from 77% in 23 to 72% in 24 to just 60% this year. So you can clearly see in this graph that trust in AI accuracy and AI favorability is declining across the board. And one of the reasons for this is this notion that AI solutions are good at building solutions that are almost right, but not quite. In this survey, 66% of developers reported that this issue is their top frustration when using AI code. This means that the code isn't obviously broken, so developers can't immediately reject it. Instead, they spend extra time carefully analyzing, debugging, and correcting the AI's output to make it production ready. Respondents said that this process of carefully identifying and fixing these issues by hand is often slower than simply rewriting them entirely. Other nuggets of interest from the report include the fact that JavaScript and Node remain the top programming languages with 66% and 48%. OpenAI's GPT models are the most popular models with 81.4% of engineers saying they use GPT, followed by Claude at 42% and Gemini at 35%. 64% of respondents say that they believe that AI is not a threat to their job, but that is down from 68% last year. One person who has some pretty strong opinions on the future of software and programming is DeepMind's CEO. This week, speaking on the Lex Friedman podcast, he explained how he thinks AI will transform programming. He said that programming and math are especially suited to AI because synthetic data can be generated and verified easily. He says that over the next five to 10 years, Programmers who adopt AI tools will become much more productive, and that the most skilled programmers could become 10x or even 100x more effective by leveraging AI. The nature of programming jobs, he says, will shift dramatically, and that some areas like front-end development may be more easily automated by AI than others. Other areas, such as architectural design, will still require human expertise, but the pace of change will be unprecedented. He argues that the impact of AI on jobs could be 10 times the impact of the industrial revolution, but also 10 times faster. And it's not just engineers who are at risk. Product managers are also worried about job displacement. And a head of product at one company did little to quell those fears this week. The head of product at Writer, that company valued at 1.9 billion, this week said that when his product managers say they don't have time to do something, he gives the work to their brand new action agent 
which he says can do at least 70% of the work for them so that they then can start working on it. So with 70% of product managers work easily automatable, according to Writer at least, then does the remaining 30% really justify a full-time role? And finally this week, Mark Zuckerberg has published a letter outlining his vision of superintelligence. In this piece, he said that we believe the benefits of superintelligence should be shared with the world as broadly as possible. The piece also doubles down on, their com on the company's commitment to personal devices like glasses. And on the company's latest earnings call, Mark Zuckerberg says that in the future, if you don't have glasses that have AI or some way to interact with AI, then you're probably going to be at a pretty significant cognitive disadvantage compared to other people. Sales of Meta's Ray-Ban smart glasses tripled in the first half of this year compared to the same period as last year. And if eventually they do get access to these new super intelligent models, then maybe he's right. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. And on that note, I'll leave it there. Thanks very much for listening and watching. I'll be back next week with another briefing.